All right, great. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, NIH Director's New Innovator Award webinar. Um, we are um, happy to have taken your questions ahead of time, those that submitted them into the uh, NIH New Innovators Award web um, email box. Uh, if you have questions that pop into your head as we go through this uh, presentation, um, you can go ahead and submit them in the Q&A box that's in the WebEx. You, know, you should be able to find that. Uh, we prefer that you use the, the Q&A box versus the chat. The Q&A box lets us uh, keep better track of the questions that you submit. And um, time permitting, we will get to your questions that you submit during the webinar. Otherwise, um, we will just stick to the ones that we received in the, the mailbox. Um, just as a notice that this webinar is being recorded and it will be publicly posted on our website following well, probably a few days after this webinar. Um, so you can go back and watch it again, um, but also just please keep in mind that anything that you're asking, um, it, it is being recorded. Um, and also just to note that this webinar is not to answer very specific individualized questions. For those, you should go ahead and email us directly um, at our mailbox. We can answer that offline, and that would be better to do um, rather than spend the time here. So um, with that, we will get started. So um, well, actually, I should introduce our panelists. Um, I'm Becky Miller. I'm a program officer in the office of the director. We also have with us um, Ravi Basavapa. He's the program leader for the high risk, high reward research program, um, and he can answer all your questions. Um, we also have our uh, our scientific review officer, Dr. Jean Carstia. Um, he's the one who is in charge of the review, and he will be able to discuss um, more of that process uh, with you later. And we also have Ellie Marcia, who is also in the office of the director, who helps us uh, manage the program, with, uh, helps us with all the money, all the all the policies. So glad to have her here as well. So. To start off with, Ravi is going to give us an overview of the program. So, Ravi. Thank you, Becky, for that introduction. And welcome all to the New Innovator Award webinar. We hope that you find it informative. So I'll begin first by providing a brief overview of the Common Fund in which the High Risk High Reward Research Program is situated, and then talk more about the High Risk High Reward Program itself, and then finally, Details about the new innovator award uh, application, and then Jean will discuss the review process. So the Common Fund is in the office of the director of NIH, and the intention of the Common Fund is to support programs that are really of trans NIH impact. Uh, something that individual institutes at NIH, or maybe a couple of institutes, couldn't or wouldn't be able to do by themselves. But these are often risky endeavors, and the if successful, the impact would be huge across NIH. We can categorize, there's about 27 or so common fund programs currently, and we can categorize them into four groups, uh, data tools or new types of clinical partnerships, new paradigms and transformative workforce support. For example, in the data tools and methods, we have a program for metabolomics in which we try to uh, make it easier for people to study uh, um, metabolic, um, the metabolic on a on a large on a larger scale, for example, by providing reagents or protocols and access to instrumentation such as mass spec. For our new paradigms, we have, uh, for example, the 4DN or the 4D nucleome program. The intention of this program is to determine the structure of the nucleome both in space and in time. New types of clinical partnerships, uh, for example, the undiagnosed diseases network to help. Uh, diagnose patients who have really have undiagnosed diseases, despite having uh, many different institutions look at them and, and trying to figure out what might be happening to them. The transformative workforce support uh, category does include the high risk high reward research program. But can you advance, please, Becky? So I'd just like to give a shout out to the common previous slide, please. Thank you. I'd just like to give a shout out to the Common Fund program as a whole, because it actually might be quite useful to you. For example, there may be FOAs that are relevant to the research that you're conducting in your lab. 
or there may be opportunities for you to have access to high-end instruments, uh, databases, reagents, or protocols, and uh, it might be worthwhile for you to check us out at commonfund.nih.gov. Next slide, please. But as I mentioned today, we're here to talk about the High Risk High Reward Research Program and the New Innovator Award Initiative in particular. So the High Risk High Reward Research Program is comprised of uh, or, uh, four different initiatives, the Pioneer Award, the New Innovator Award, the Transformative Research Award, and the Early Independence Award. They together uh, have funding opportunities that we announce each year. So they're once a year that we have uh, opportunities with single receipt dates, one per year. The overall objective of the High Risk High Reward Research Program is to support high risk, high impact ideas. And so for all of these initiatives then, we do not require preliminary data or a detailed experimental plan. So we really mean that we don't require preliminary data. Uh, often you may read FOAs in which uh, preliminary data, in which it's stated that preliminary data are not required, but that's really the case uh, for, for this program. We try to educate both the applicants and reviewers not to expect much data. I'd also like to state that uh, this is in a way the investigator initiated program for the Common Fund, whereas the other programs have specific scientific objectives that they hope to achieve within their time period. For the high risk high research program, we welcome uh, applications in any topic that's relevant to the very broad mission of NIH. So the topic is set by the applicant, and it can be whatever he or she is really interested in pursuing, as long as it's within the broad mission of NIH. Next slide, please. Uh, and so this does include, for example, behavioral, social, biomedical, applied, and the formal sciences, as well as science that may be characterized as basic translation, translational or clinical research. Next slide, please. And very importantly, we'd like to encourage applications from investigators with diverse backgrounds and from the full spectrum of eligible institutions. So, you know, there's a lot of talent across this nation. We want to be sure that we tap into, the, uh, in, into that uh, scientific potential that's represented in the country, not, uh, not focus on a few institutions or a few uh, subject matter um, or a few subjects but really tap into the full spectrum of research that's represented in the country and by the full spectrum of investigators and, and institutions in the country. Next slide, please. Before I begin, uh, provide a little more detail about the New Innovator Award program, I'd first like to acknowledge the High Risk High Reward Research Working Group, the roster is given on this slide. The HRHR program is a large program with many moving parts. And to help uh, make, to help us crank through this machine, then we have uh, this working group. We have representation from almost all the ICs at NIH. And they helped to uh, set the policies for NIH to help us, uh, for the HRHR program, to help us make funding decisions. And they serve as the liaisons between the HRHR program and the respective uh, institute. Okay, now for the uh, New Innovator Award Program. The New Innovator Award Program, the intention of this program is to support unusually creative early career investigators who have uh, some ideas that they believe are really very bold and if successful uh, would have the uh, potential for unusually broad impact. So the New Innovator Award Program was started in 2007. As I mentioned, it's targeted for early stage investigators. So it's restricted to early stage investigators. We define an early stage investigator as one who does not have a substantial NIH grant as a PI, and who is still within 10 years of a receipt of the doctoral degree or completion of clinical training. For this uh, initiative, we require awardees to commit at least 25% research effort. So this is research effort only. We don't consider effort toward clinical duties, administrative duties, or teaching duties, for example. It's only for research. The awards are uh, pretty generous. The award level is $1.5 million. 
over about a five year project period. The unusual aspect for this initiative, though, is that all the money is given in the first year of the project period. So if you get a new innovator award, uh, uh, the, and the award is made next year. So next year you'd get $1.5 million in direct costs and uh, the associated indirect costs. And you're going to have the entire project period, multi year project period over which you would be able to spend it. This provides some flexibilities for especially for those who are that might be useful, uh, especially for those who are starting their research labs. For example, in the first year, you may wish to spend a lot of money buying capital equipment, or you may wish to ramp up more slowly and uh, add personnel later on in the project. Uh, however, an important aspect of multi year funding is that. Uh, all the money must be spent within the about five year project period, five years minus about three months. And uh, that's by that's by government statute. NIH has no discretion in the matter. Uh, no cost extensions are not allowed. So if you do get a new innovator award, please be sure that you spend all the money within the project period. Otherwise, the money goes back to the treasury. Uh, and the new innovator award uses the DP2 activity code. Uh, the standard granted NIH is the R01. This is a DP2. And you may uh, hear this referred to as a DP2. That's a colloquial term, and it refers usually to the new innovator award program. OK, next, please. So I'll provide a little more detail about the application. We wanted to make the application very different than the standard R01 application. And uh, as you'll hear from Gene, the review process is also very different. Some key aspects of the new innovator award application are, are listed in this table. For example, uh, specific games page is not used for the new innovator award application. The research strategy essay for the R01, it's a 12 page research strategy section in which the expect expectations for providing a lot of experimental details and uh, preliminary data are high. However, for the new innovator award application, it's 10 pages. It's a primary component of the application, and I'll talk more about this uh, later in the presentation. For the new innovator award, the buy sketch of only the PI is allowed. Uh, PI uh, buy sketches of other key personnel or collaborators are not allowed. And that's because the focus is very much on the qualities of the investigator, on the qualities of the PI. The bibliography and reference cited section is not used for the new innovator award application. You are encouraged to uh, provide the really critical citations for that, that provide the foundation for your proposal, but they must be within the 10 page limit. The budget, no detailed budget is allowed. Uh, typically for an NIH grant, you have to provide a lot of details, especially when the, the um, the award level is over $250,000 per year in direct cost. But here, all you have to do is say, hey, I want $1.5 million. And uh, that's all we require, and that's all and that's all you can actually submit. You can't provide any more details about the budget. The equipment section, you do not use. Letters of support are not used. Resource sharing plan, they're not used as well. Uh, but resource sharing plan will be requested as just in time information if a, an award is likely. And next slide, please. And other component, no, previous slide, I just highlighted this in bold. In the bottom uh, row, other components and forms, so, but you use these other components such as the authentication of key biological chemical resources, vertebrate animals and human subjects or biohazards. Uh, be sure to use those if you do if they do apply to the research that you're proposing. It's a common mistake, for example, for people not to include authentication of key biological chemical resources, but it is required as part of the application if it's appropriate for you to use. Overall guidance is follow the instructions in the SF-424 application guide unless there's specific information uh, guiding you otherwise in the FOA. Okay. Next slide, please. So a bit more about the research strategy essay. As I mentioned, it's 10 pages, and we ask you to provide the following information within that 10 pages. First, the project science areas, uh, one-digit code, 
an abbreviation for the primary and secondary areas. I think maybe Jean will talk more about this, but and you may also have noticed in the FOA that we list nine broad science areas in the FOA. Uh, these are very broad and often overlapping, for example, neuroscience or molecular and cellular biology, behavioral and social science, um, but nine such areas. And we ask you to uh, designate one of those broad science areas as your primary area and another one as a secondary science area. And that, inf that information is to be provided here in the research strategy essay, as well as in the agency routing identifier. That's also, that information is provided in the FOA. But the bulk of the research strategy essay should be devoted to the project description. Here we ask you to describe of what, what it is that you're proposing, why it's important, why it's so innovative. Again, preliminary data are not required. Um, if you do provide data, they will be evaluated. So please be sure to, you do provide compelling data if you do provide data. Um, most people, it's, it's often the case that um, it's, it's not uncommon for people not to provide any data and still succeed. But most people do provide some data uh, to give a glimmer of hope that whatever they're proposing can actually be achieved. If you provide too much data, they can actually work against you because reviewers would may say, well, everything looks eminently feasible. This is better suited for a standard R1 than, uh, than a new innovator award. And along these lines, we ask you to state in the FOA that per the instructions in the FOA, you're not providing substantial uh, preliminary data or a detailed experimental plan. Given that, however, you should still be able to convince the reviewers that you have thought deeply about the project, that you have considered what you consider, that you have considered uh, the risky elements, that you articulate what those are, that you have um, thought of alternate approaches, for example, uh, that you will pursue the research in a rigorous and robust way. If you're using uh, vertebrate animals or human subjects, you should also give the numbers of subjects that you plan to use and uh, key biological variables, such as whether you're using sex as a biological variable. Usually uh, people do that as a, people do use sex as a biological variable unless they're really compelling explanations not to do so. So overall, you need to convince the reviewers that, uh, you know, you just can't say I'm going to solve cancer or Alzheimer's disease. You have to back it up with some really compelling logic of how you're going to go about this. Uh, you, in this essay, you're also asked to address innovativeness, provide an argument of why what we're proposing really is exceptionally innovative, uh, asked to provide some description of yourself, of why uh, you have conducted uh, or document how you have conducted unusually innovative research in the past, how you've been able to overcome substant substantial conceptual and technical hurdles, been uh, willing and able to challenge paradigms or establish new paradigms, Investigator quality, okay, suitability for a new innovator work program. Here, you're asked to uh, argue why what you're proposing really is well aligned with the spirit of the new innovator award and not suited for more conventional NIH grant activities such as the R01. You're also asked to provide a statement of research effort commitment that, you'll, that you are willing and able to, to commit at least 25% research effort toward the project. Bibli bibliography and citations, again, you're encouraged to provide the most critical citations in uh, within the 10 pages to help buttress your arguments. But they may be in, a, in an abbreviated form as long as the identifier is unique. You don't need to provide the full citation, but some abbreviated form is fine. Okay, next slide, please. So maybe a few points for you to consider while you compose your essay. Uh, as Dean will describe, there, it, we use a very unusual review process and the, the, many of the reviewers will not be topic experts in what you're proposing. So be sure that what you write can be easily appreciated by people who are well outside your field, uh, and that they're able to easily recognize why what you're proposing really is ex exceptionally innovative and why it does have the potential for unusually broad impact. So it may be useful for you to begin with the description of the landscape of the field, what the current boundaries are, or what the current state of the art is, and why what you're proposing 
is really would help to push well past the current boundaries. It really helps to set context uh, for these applications. And, a lot, and then ease the reader into the jargon of the field. Don't assume that all the reviewers will have the same level of expertise that you might expect for a standard R01 review. So ease the readers into the whole ideas and, and the jargon of the field. Though no data or detailed experimental plans are required, and again, you need to convince the readers that you have thought deeply about the project, that you've identified the risky aspects, how they'll be mitigated, that you've thought of alternate approaches, and convince the reviewers that the research will be performed in a robust and rigorous manner. You know, that if you're proposing a new technique, then how are you going to validate that the technique actually is measuring what you uh, hope to measure or, and, or provide estimates of uh, numbers of human or animal subjects uh, and that sex will be considered as a biological variable. Those are all important elements of rigor in, what, in the research proposal. Okay, next slide. Dean. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Becky. Uh, this is an exciting time for me. Uh, this is my first uh, time with this program. This program is a long-lived program here at the NIH. Uh, uh, a lot of successful applicants uh, and, and, and awardees uh, for this program. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to, to keeping this program going uh, further and, and continue. It's success. So uh, I'm Gene Karstea. Uh, I'm at the Center for Scientific Review, and, and our job is to review uh, the applications that come in. This is not a big, it's not a small job. It, it, it's actually a very big job. Um, and uh, though my name is the only one up here, uh, we're building our team. Um, we're going to have a, a, a um, a talented new SRO joining us uh, in July uh, to team up uh, on this effort, and and we'll go forward, um, uh, and we're, we'll be ready for applications that come in in August. So I'm uh, currently the chief of the Cardiovascular and Respiratory Sciences IRG, and in uh, in uh, in CSR, the Center for Scientific Review. This is where this effort is being uh, headquartered. Uh, so it's 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 uh, coming out of our IRG. Let me go, uh, next slide, please. Let me give you an outline of of what we're going to do to review your applications that come in. Um, this is just uh, an outline of the review process. Uh, obviously, the the great ideas come out of your you and your lab um, through applications that you put together, as Robbie um, has outlined. Uh, the applications are sent uh, to the NIH uh, and received at the Center for Scientific Review, and they come via grants.gov, uh, the process that you will um, um, submit your applications. Uh, deadline for applications is late August. I believe it's August 21st is when uh, uh, your applications are due. And then begins the pre uh, review process of evaluating the applications. I'll, I'll, I'll go over that on the next slides here. But just going down through this outline here, which will I, I will detail in the, in the next slides, um, after the applications are received and initially evaluated, uh, they go through a two-stage review process. This is different than our normal standard study sections uh, where we evaluate, let's say, R01 and, and R21 applications. Um, the two stages of review. First stage is all the applications are uh, assigned to experts that we find across the country. Um, we will assign the application to them and uh, they will be evaluated uh, and, and, and submitted back to us. From that, um, finalist applications will be generated from the en masse uh, bulk of applications that we get. Uh, again, it's not small. Uh, we can uh, imagine somewhere between 500 and possibly 700 applications. That's what we had historically in the past. So uh, going to stage two is what we call the finalists. I'll outline what the finalists are. Uh, the finalist applications will be sent to a board of editors. I'll talk about that uh, as well. Um, and, and all of the finalist applications will be discussed and final scores will be generated.
from the final scores and the discussion, the product of the discussion, the, the summary of the discussion, that information will be transmitted to um, the advisory council that is set up. Um, the advisory council is made up of members of many of the institutes and centers around the NIH that will be funding these applications or that will be uh, that will be uh, awarding uh, the applications here. That's why we have this funny name called the Council of Councils. It's the council of the different councils, uh, uh, the, the institutes and center councils. Um, from that advisory uh, council meeting and, and the recommendations that, that come out of that, um, there will be uh, the selection of awardees that are being made by the office of the director and members of the institutes and centers of the NIH. Um, and uh, from that, uh, a public announcement will be made about a year from now, a little over a year from now in September, uh, which will allow you to uh, uh, work on your our projects, uh, generate great results, and hopefully will be the genesis of, of many more NIH applications that you'll have in the future. So next slide, please. Let's go through the peer review process. Um, as we mentioned, uh, when applications come in um, and uh, uh, that they arrive at CSR in our group, uh, they will go through a pre-stage one. All applications are assigned to one panel. They are our panel that, we, that is located within CVRS. Um, uh, an administrative review will be uh, will be generated. That is a check for completeness of the application, uh, and and an assessment of of or a confirmation of eligibility as an early stage investigator of each of uh, of the applicants. There, um, the check for completeness is done so that we can make sure that all applications are compliant. Applications are then grouped into the areas of science, as Ravi uh, mentioned. There are nine areas of science, uh, and uh, I think you have access to them. I can go over them. Uh, number one is behavioral and social sciences. Two is chemical biology. Three is clinical and translational research. Four is infectious diseases and immunology. Five is instrumentation and engineering. Six is molecular and cellular biology. Seven is neuroscience. Eight is high throughput and integrative biology. And nine is bioinformatics and computational biology. Um, from the applications that are in, we will look through uh, and identify or evaluate for potential conflicts of interest for each of the applications, that is institutional conflicts, collaborative conflicts. And these are conflicts that may exclude certain reviewers from reviewing certain applications. Uh, we wanna make sure that that all of the review of merit is based certainly on merit and not uh, on any uh, inappropriate bias that may be uh, generated uh, by these inherent conflicts of interest. And finally, uh, male reviewers will be then recruited to cover all representative areas of science uh, in, in, in the proportion of, of the number of applications that we get for each area. Next slide, please. Which gets us into the peer, uh, the, the stage one of the peer review. So uh, we will recruit and seat a panel of male reviewers. Male simply means that that uh, these uh, reviewers will review from their own venue uh, um, and 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 submit their their critiques to us. Uh, in in as compared to standing panels or, or, or normal study sections that we have at the NIH where reviewers will both review it and then uh, attend the meeting themselves. In this case, uh, their assignment is to review applications and send it to us um, without coming to, 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 the, um, to, to the next stage of the review there. So we'll recruit the panel of male reviewers. We will match the reviewers with the science and we will, uh, we will assign three reviewers for every application. Uh, the evaluation uh, of your applications, as Ravi uh, uh, indicated, is, uh, will be done a little bit differently than, than normal R01 or R21 or normal applications that you would uh, submit to the NIH. Uh, there are three criteria that will be observed. Um, number one is the importance and potential impact of the scientific problem. Number two is the novelty and innovativeness of the, of the approach. And number three is the creative potential of you, the early stage investigator. 
Um, those are the three characteristics that will come out of your application that will be evaluated by the reviewers. Overall impact scores uh, will be generated uh, from one to nine, one being the best, nine being the worst. Um, and um, an overall impact paragraph uh, will be generated for each of, of these, um, for, for each of these applications here, based on those three criteria and by the evaluation of your application. Next slide, please. So the selection of the finalist that will go on to stage two. Two ways of, do, of doing that. Number one is, is by based on the rank scores that we get back from the male reviewers, the average of the three reviewers uh, will have a, a ranking from best to worst. Um, there will be the, the, the top scores will be automatically moved over uh, uh, as a finalist. Then there'll be um, an area where uh, it will be not only uh, the, the score, but it'll be a combination of the scores and the impact statements. Say these are for say applications that may have received two stellar scores and one not so stellar scores. And there may be a group there of applications there. These applications will be selected by the editorial reviewers. Uh, the stage two reviewer. So, so uh, the two ways that that applications get it. Number one is is the, the the very top scoring applications. Number two is is high scoring applications, but also applications that the editorial reviewers uh, think uh, would be uh, um, strong and substantial applications. In total, approximately twenty percent of all submitted applications will advance to stage two. Next, next uh, slide, please. So what is uh, stage two? Stage two is the editorial board review. Uh, the editorial board will be consisting of about 25 panelists, 20, 24 to 27 state panelists. Um, these are senior members of the scientific community. These are members that are experts, uh, in, in uh, both experts technically and in, and and broad under uh, experts in terms of broad vision broad understanding of areas of science that are able to identify uh, um, innovative and and uh innovative applications that can advance science in in, in, a, in a major way in a substantial way um so with that editorial board um each finalist application is assigned to three editor reviewers okay um and all of the applications will be discussed. Uh, scoring is focused on impact and innovation. Um, each assigned uh, editor or reviewer uh, will provide uh, an overall impact statement, an overall impact paragraph, as well as the score. Um, and uh, the release of the final scores will come at the end of the meeting. Um, uh, the, the, the meeting will be held in, in, in March. So uh, uh, within 30 days after the March meeting, uh, uh, statements will, will be sent out. Uh, and uh, for the, the applications discussed during that meeting, uh, the discussed statements uh, will receive uh, um, overall impact statements and a summary of the discussion uh, from that meeting as a product of the meeting the not discussed applications, the 80% or so that are, are not discussed, um, will receive uh, the stage one critiques, the critiques from the three original male reviewers. Okay. Um, next slide, please. I know this is a lot here. Um, I am available. Uh, should you uh, have any questions about the process, um, feel free to contact me uh, by my email address and I can answer any questions along those lines. Okay. All right, thanks, Jean. All right, so you've had an overview of the program, a bit about the application and the review process. So we'll go ahead and start answering uh, questions that were submitted through our mailbox. Um, once again, if you have questions um, now that have occurred to you during this webinar, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and we will try to answer them time permitting. Um, if we do not get to your question um, or, um, or you weren't satisfied with the answer, you can go ahead and email us um, at our, our uh, award mailbox, the New Innovator Awards mailbox, and we can answer that offline. So if you don't get your answer here, just email us and we will get to it. 
Um, once again, just remind you that this webinar is being recorded. Um, we're going to try to answer the questions based on some broad topics of eligibility, the application and submission process, budget and review process. Um, but as questions come in, we will we will try to answer them. So I'm going to ask Ravi. Uh, yes, you're unmuted. So um, ask Ravi to answer some of these questions that we have received. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe uh, describe what the early early stage investigator status is. Um, the, yeah, so the early stage investigator status as defined by NIH is uh, an investigator who does not have substantial NIH support as a PI. By substantial, it's R01 or many other mechanisms. If we, if you search using your favorite search engine um, or NIH ESI or early stage investigator, you'll come to a web page in which there's a listing of, of grants that do not disqualify you from early stage investigator status. Some of those that do not disqualify you are the R21, the K99, R00, the R03, grants like that do not disqualify you, but uh, others do. So uh, you cannot have had any substantial NIH support as PI. The second condition is that you must be still within 10 years of receipt of your terminal research degree, typically a PhD but, or any sort of research degree, or completion of uh, your clinical training, which can include fellowship. And does that NIH funding, those R01 equivalents, does that include maybe grants from like NSF or other federally funded agencies? Good question. <laughs> no, we can, we care only about NIH grants. Um, and then is it possible to extend your ESI status? Yes, there is a uh, recently streamlined mechanism for requesting ESI status extension. It, uh, there's a website for submitting, or you can do it through your comments account, I believe, as well now. Um, so you provide the reasons if you had to go on medical leave or to take care of family. Um, those are often reasons that are cited and, and successful. There's no guarantee that any application or request that you make will, will be granted for extension. But those are some very common reasons. Uh, given the pandemic situation, uh, if your research effort has been halted because of COVID-19 and your inability to conduct research, then that also will be considered as a possible reason for granting you ESI extension. Um, and are postdocs eligible to apply? Yes, they are. That's pretty rare for postdocs to apply. The condition is that you must have a guarantee of an independent research position, that is, have your own lab uh, by September 1st of, in this case, of 2021. So you should have something already lined up. and. It's the institution that submits the application on your behalf. The, the award actually goes to the institution, not to the investigator. And the very act of an institution submitting an application on your behalf affirms that you would have a suitable position at that institution in case of award by September 1st, 2021. Right. And are only new investigators eligible for applying? There's, that's a nuanced sort of response is needed for that. New investigator is an NIH term, which means somebody who has never had NIH funding. In addition to that, or sub, who has never had substantial NIH funding. In addition to that condition is that there is a time window for eligibility uh, that is within 10 years of receipt of PhD, uh, terminal research degree or completion of, of clinical training. So you have to have both new investigator status as well as be within the, the required time window. And there's um, a question about the ESI eligibility cutoff. Is that based on time of application or time of award? It's based on time of application. And um, is there a way you can check your status beforehand? Uh, well, yeah, so you can enter your, all the relevant details in your comments account and then it should the uh, NIH system should calculate your status and indicate. Okay. Um, 
Let's see. And if um, you get the new innovator award, does that remove your early stage investigator status? Yes, it does. Uh, the DP2, uh, the new innovator award is considered a substantial uh, NIH grant. And so receipt of the award would remove your status as ESI. Um, and if you are going to be awarded like an R01 equivalent award around the same time as the DP2, um, can you still receive the DP2? The condition is that since this is meant for early stage investigators exclusively, you cannot have an R01 that's active at the time that uh, a new innovator award is issued. So you can have two, for example, you could have an R01 application and a DP2 application uh, being reviewed or and being considered for funding at the same time. They have to be scientifically distinct proposals, of course. And if the timing is such that the R01 uh, award is, is becomes active before the DP2 award is issued, then at that instant you become in, ineligible for the new innovator award. Um, and are projects in behavioral and social sciences competitive, and is there a bias in their awarding rate? Uh, we are we are very closely monitoring such aspects of scientific diversity as well, and our analysis indicates that we do uh, about as well as the general R01 pool in, in receiving behavioral social science research and awarding behavioral social science research. So there's no bias against such research in the new innovator award review process. And we really would like to diversify the scientific portfolio for the new innovator award program. Um, and can proposed projects cover both basic and applied aims, or are successful proposals more likely to stick to one or the other? Um, people can, uh, can propose uh, projects that span both basic and applied not too uncommon. Um, the other thing you should consider is innovation and impact. Uh, the innovation might be in how you, um, in the basic approaches that you're proposing, or it could be more in the translational aspects once you have the, the basic uh, components of the research uh, uh, worked out. Right, and is it okay for a person to explore an area outside their expertise if it's the next reasonable step for their work? Yeah, so there are two points to that, I think. So we do encourage, or people who are proposing research that really pushes themselves a bit scientifically, I think tends to do fairly well in review. We want people to, to stretch themselves scientifically. Uh, so what, and the next step is not something that you should proposed for the new innovator award. We're not looking for the logical logical extension of what you've been doing or the next uh, set of logical steps for, for what you've been doing. It should be something that's, that's a bit of a leap, both for the science and for you. Um, and how important it is, is it to have a track record that covers the entire scope of the proposed project to be competitive? Or can collaborators be used to fill in gaps? Uh, collaborators definitely can be used to fill in gaps. You don't need to demonstrate expertise in all aspects of what you're proposing, again, because it's good if you do stretch yourself a bit scientifically. Although we don't accept letters of support, you can mention letters of support. I mean, you can mention collaborators in your 10 page research essay um, at, and, and briefly describe how they would be contribute, how they would be contributing to the project. But it should be clear to the reviewers that although you have these collaborators, uh, that you're the one who's still driving the scientific agenda, it's your vision that's being pursued. I can tell you from a review standpoint that when we have early stage investigators uh, that have applications in there, we instruct the, the reviewers. And the reviewers do know that um, uh, they don't look at track record, they look at expertise and training and, and their ability to, to complete the project. So uh, for early stage investigators, track records, uh, uh, it, it, it's the expertise and the training that, that they have. Great, thank you, Dean. Mm -hmm. um, we just have some more questions about ESI. So for MDs who have done residency and fellowship, does the ESI um, completion date count those or is it to, from your uh, degree? 
No, it's clinical training. So it includes periods for residency as well as fellowship. All right. Um, and um, we, um, can non tenure track faculty, such as research scientists, apply? Yes. And again, that's determined eligibility for that is determined by your institution. If your institution is willing to submit uh, an application on your behalf, that signifies to us that the institution will provide the necessary resources as, as described in the application for you to execute the research and that you would have status at the institution to pursue the research. Um, and are applications of investigators who have the ESI extensions treated separately or differently during the review process? Nope, that's totally blind to the reviewers. All right. Um, okay, some of these are very specific. Um, all right. Um, is clinical research welcome um, and is it underrepresented in the program? Clinical research certainly is welcome and we're always seeking to expand again the diversity of our scientific portfolio. Um, that being said, you, clinical research, since you're using humans uh, often and we're soliciting high risk research that has high reward, it might be a little bit tricky to propose such research. So we really do encourage you to reach out to um, contacts for the at the most relevant institute to discuss your clinical research that you're thinking about submitting for the new innovator award. They would be able to provide some guidance, first of all, on, on the research itself, but also to help ensure that what you're proposing really is conforms to the clinical uh, research policies of that particular institute. The clinical research policies vary from institute to institute at NIH. If a new innovator award is made, it's managed by the scientifically most relevant institute. And for an institute to manage that award, uh, clinical award, it, the research must conform to the clinical research policies of that respective institute. All right. Um, uh, would um, if you're a PI on a multi PI R01 grant, um, would that disqualify you from yes. the new innovator award? Yes, it would. And yes, so even if you're not receiving significant funding from that, if you're still listed as a multi-PI, you would- If you're a PI, right. Yeah, you'd be listed, okay. If you're um, a PI on a multi-PI or a PI on a single PI on a grant that disqualifies you from receiving the new innovator award, then you're disqualified. Okay. All right. Um, how much emphasis is there on new methods or technologies as opposed to solely building towards a scientific paradigm shift using existing methods or technologies for this award? Both types of innovation, technical innovation and conceptual innovation are welcome. Uh, it's often the case though that there's a combination of, of both types of innovation and the relative emphasis varies from application to application. For example, somebody may have a really cool tool that he or she is thinking about developing uh, that and that could be very impactful and to help assess the utility of that tool. He or she could also propose in the application to use that tool to address important biological questions, maybe one or two different biological questions to help set the paradigm. Or conversely, a person may have really fundamental question that he or she is asking and then bringing uh, more conventional techniques to answer that problem, but maybe in a very unusual way, maybe no one has used those particular methods or perspectives before to answer this important biological question, or maybe to adapt that existing technique or concept, there has to be some significant uh, uh, significant innovation that's required to make sure that it can be applied to the, to the uh, biological problem that's being considered. Right, and um... Uh, are you allowed to submit uh, applications that uh, have research overlap between them and the DP2 application? Not NIH, nope. You cannot have, a, at the same time, applications that are substantially overlapping, for example, an R01 and a, and a DP2. Uh, 
the NIH policy is that if you do have two proposals uh, that do overlap substantially, then before you can submit one, you have to wait for the summary statement of the other to be to be released. Um, and is it possible to submit more than one application to this funding opportunity announcement? Nope, only one. Uh, it's stated in the FOA, only one application per PI. PIs can submit multiple years, but that's another. Okay, great. Um, and then we have some questions uh, for small businesses um, and industry. Uh, so have there been small business applicants before and have they been funded? Um, small businesses certainly are eligible for, for, uh, for the new innovator award. I don't recall any offhand <laughs> being, being uh, rewarded. And we get very, very few applications from, from small businesses, but they are eligible. Um, and can you share their proposals? We have a couple of sample applications listed on our website, but they're not from small businesses. Yes, there are privacy concerns, so we cannot share um, applications from uh, past applicants with you um, without their express permission. So there are two applications that are posted on our website, though, so please go there and you can see examples there. Um, could you go over a bit of what some of the intellectual property rules are um, for uh, businesses that may get this award? Uh, yeah, that might be a little bit specialized for this discussion. We'd be able to follow up. But the same IP rules that apply to other NIH awards apply to this. Um, and are applicants from smaller or teaching oriented institutions at a significant disadvantage um, in, this, in applying? No, we really do encourage applications from the broad spectrum of institutions within the United States. Um, so you just have to, you have to convince the reviewers that you're able to conduct the research at your institution. That's the primary requirement that, that we have at NIH. Right, um, and is there a disadvantage to applying multiple times for subsequent um, funding opportunities? No, it's very common for people to submit applications over multiple years. Each application is considered a new application. So if you do submit in a subsequent year, you should be sure that you do not mention any uh, application from a previous year. If you do, Gene or someone else at CSR may withdraw your application. <laughs> so please be sure that you don't mention any previous application. Uh, and it, yeah, it's not uncommon for people to submit two, three, sometimes more times for either becoming ineligible or getting the award. All right. Um, and are annual progress reports um, required for funded awards? Yes, even for the multi-year funded awards, annual progress reports are required. Okay. Um, wow, there are a lot of questions coming in. Um, let's see. Uh, is COVID research allowed? Yes, COVID research is allowed. There's anything within the broad mission of NIH. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. All right. So some of these are really specific. Um, asking about what to do about DUNS numbers and registering in ERI Commons. So once again, yeah. I would refer you to the funding opportunity announcement as well as our website um, on the application and award guidance. Um, it has um, that also contains the sample applications in there. Uh, we may come back to some of these uh, eligibility questions as we get through the 132 questions that have been submitted. Right. <laughs> yes, so let's right now let's move on to um, application and submission questions. Um, all right, uh, first number one question that we've been getting is, are there example applications to look at? Yes, yep. they are online. Once again, there's there's only two available right now because once again, we have to get permission from the PIs as well as the institutions and have to go through the whole redaction and process. So there, those are the two that are available now. We will hopefully add to them as time goes on. Um, let's see, um, is the application process different for small businesses? No, you just have to make sure that your business is registered appropriately. Um, and I guess, is, is there additional help for small businesses if they don't have their own grants office or grant support? 
Uh, yeah, that's usually done through ERA uh, help desk. So there, if you look in the FOA, there's there's uh, information about whom to contact. All right, um, and then we got quite a few questions about the areas of science. Um, so what's the purpose of these uh, areas of science and how do I choose between them? To help in the review process is gene outlined primarily. Uh, and you're asked to choose two areas, one as a primary, one as a science, primary area, one as a secondary area. Um, and which ones you choose are pretty much up, are, are definitely up to you, but you should consider which sets of reviewers might have, might more easily be able to appreciate the innovation and potential impact that you're proposing. If you're, you know, if you're choosing to develop tools, but you're addressing a deep biological question, then do you think it's a molecular biologist or cell biologist who will be able to appreciate more what you're proposing? Or is it somebody who's an, who's an engineer, for example? Or if you're doing something that's behavioral and social science, but also has some um, computational biology, then which which type of reviewer do you think would be most easily able to recognize the, the coolness of what you're proposing? Um, can NIH staff help me select my areas of science? Uh, typically, no. I mean, I'm able to give low resolution input if you want, but uh, I think. We recognize that the science areas overlap substantially. Um, and could you just describe the category, the science area for high throughput and integrative biology? High throughput integrative biology is a large area of science that encompasses, for example, uh, 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 microfluidics, if you're proposing that for high throughput sort of assays. Or integrative, using what are commonly known as uh, omics approaches or systems biology approaches. That's what we mean by uh, high throughput and, and integrative biology. Something that tries to uh, has a lot of data associated with it and tries to integrate it <laughs> in some way. All right. And is there um, information or um, I guess statistics on the success of um, the different? Science area designations between the applications. Uh, I don't think there's anything public out there, but we do take a look, uh, of course, to see how the various areas are doing. And I don't think there's any real bias for any, for or against any particular area of science over the years. Great. Um, and there's a question: um, Are letters of recommendation required or allowed? Nope. And nope, not required, not allowed. Um, are letters of support allowed? Nope. Um, all right. Um, should uh, uh, should uh, investigators have a statistician? Let's see. Should you have a collaborator like a statistician to justify the sample size in your proposal? Uh, you don't have to have a statistician as a collaborator. And if you, it's a good idea to give some sort of power analysis uh, to justify the numbers of subjects that you're using. But, you know, uh, if, but if you're what you're proposing doesn't really require high level of contribution from a statistician, and 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 a statistics is not a skill that you happen to have, then, um, and and if, and if it's not a if it's not a a critical component of what you're proposing, then a collaborator is not necessarily be named. Right. Um, and could you elaborate on what you mean by high risk and what would be an acceptable risk um, for a research proposal that has a clinical uh, that that uh, may require clinical work? I guess. Yeah, risk is in the eyes of the reviewers as well as reward. So something, the way they calibrate risk is, some, one way they calibrate risk is this is, is this the sort of science that they tend to see in R01 applications? Or is this something that's really outs, uh, outs, outside the so-called box? Is this something that 
really is intuitive, is not intuitive, maybe even counterintuitive? Is it something that other people already are not pursuing and for which there is very little supporting data? Okay. Um, all right. Um, and are sub awards allowed to support a collaborator from dis different institutions? Yes, such awards are allowed. Okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, what should the format be of the research strategy essay? People are, as long as you have the same overall structure as for the instructions in the FOA, people are pretty creative in how they <laughs> write their essay. So, I think the major things to keep in mind is make it easy for the reviewers to understand what you're proposing, why it is so uh, innovative and why it is potentially so impactful. So however you wish to organize your essay within the, within the constraints of the FOA, that's the primary consideration you have ease for the reviewers. Um, and how much detail is expected in the research plan and how should it be presented? Well, you only have 10 pages and we ask you to devote quite a bit of the 10 pages to other aspects of the application, such as your innovativeness and other things. So there really isn't much uh, effort. There really isn't much space within the 10 pages to, to go into many experimental details. And we do ask you to state that you're not providing a detailed experimental plan. Uh, so at the same time, so you don't need to, for example, describe the the proverbial pH of the buffer that you're going to use, but you should convince the reviewer CS yes, that you have thought about this project and, and how you might pursue it. So overall, uh, you know, low resolution sort of approach that you're taking uh, typically suffices. Okay. Um, how large should the project you propose be? And is there a penalty for being overly ambitious? Yeah, well, what you propose should be commensurate with the, the scope of the award, $1.5 million uh, over about five years. You are encouraged to be a bit more ambitious than for the typical R01, but you, uh, but you should not be crazy ambitious. Um, is it better to include preliminary data in the application or would the presence of preliminary data be counted against the innovativeness of the proposal? Yeah, again, some data, it's, it's most people do provide some data to, to give uh, some reason for hoping that whatever is being proposed will be achieved. Uh, some people don't provide any data and still they are very competitive and receive the award. Uh, it's happened, uh, it's not uncommon for when people provide a lot of data that the reviewers will say, oh, this is feasible, it's better suited for uh, an R01 than uh, DB2. Um, and how should collaborations be addressed in the application? Um, should you already have collaborators identified and specify them by name, or should you make a more general statement saying that you will get collaborators in a particular area? Typically, it's better to have someone already identified and named in the essay. Maybe Jean can address this point. I think uh, you're trying to get across that, that you have uh, a, an innovative project that, that you can actually accomplish. Uh, um, it, it is far reaching, it is, it is uh, high level in terms of, of, of high risk, uh, but, but convincing, having, having that balance that you can convince them you could actually uh, get a good shot at getting this thing done is, is important. So um, hedging your bets and, and, and showing that, that you've uh, uh, teamed up with the right talent is, is important. Um, but do you need to include collaborators for the application to be successful? No. Right, and uh, does this application include a biosketch? Yes, only the, the, the biosketch of only the PI is accepted. Great emphasis on this program. Again, it's a, it's a quality of the PI. So the, the focus is on the qualifications of the PI. Um, by sketches of other people are not allowed. Um, and should uh, you avoid overlap of information between the bio sketch and what's in the essay? Um, you can use the two to reinforce each other. Okay. 
Um, and can you use hyperlinks to products, inventions, or tools, websites um, in the application? You can, but I don't think the reviewers are obligated to follow the links. Is that right, Jim? They're not. And, and also, in, in some cases, uh, um, sending them to a Google page or to a, um, to a YouTube site or, or something like that um, is not permitted. Uh, um, the, from, from the review side. Exactly. Yeah. Because uh, I can reveal the identity of the reviewer. Because you can identify where the reviewer came from. So um, um, th those are not permitted for review. Okay. Um, and should I include startup funds from my department in the current and pending support? No, that is not necessary. All right. And um, how do you respond to COVID related delays in? Um, things like your publications that may impact your qualifications in the application. If you think that this would, one way to do it would be to request an extension in your ESI status. Um, in your bio sketch, you can also state that you've had this delay or pause in your research activities. Okay. And then we've probably gotten like 10 questions um, asking about the success rate mm -hmm. and the number of applications we receive for the new Innovator Award each year. Yeah, um, as you said, between five to 700 applications per year. And the overall success rate tends to be between eight to 10%. Okay. Whew, time is flying. Okay. so. Um, there are a bunch more questions on this, but I think we're going to go on over to the next section and we'll try to come back as if we can. All right, we have um, just a few questions about budget. So, um, number one is like, do I need to submit a budget justification? No, you do not. Just say that you want $1.5 million. Um, what can be included uh, in budget costs? The typical NIH policies for Budgets are also pertain to the new innovator award. You can request, for example, salaries uh, for you and personnel in your lab, uh, supplies, equ equipment, travel, publication costs. Okay. Um, and can you ask for less than the 1.5 million? You can, but uh, Sure, but it's just, it's very uncommon for somebody to do that. Okay. Um, uh, so can the budget include costs of collecting data from foreign, foreign institutions or foreign countries? Yes, that would be considered a foreign component. Foreign components are allowed. The requirement is that the app, that the awardee institution must be a U.S. domestic institution but foreign components of the research are allowed. You can have collaborators abroad where you yourself can go abroad to collect data. Uh, it typically, depending on the level of effort involved or whether human subjects or animals or um, money is transferred, you, will, you may also need State Department clearance. Um, and uh, are these awards renewable? No, they are not. The DP2 or the New Innovator Award is is not renewable. Um, and is the award transferable if I change institutions? Yes, the as long as it's a US domestic institution or otherwise an eligible institution for the new innovator award. And it's fairly common for people to, to change institutions during their new innovator award project period. All right. Um, uh, our, let's see. Are no cost extensions allowed for the unexpended funds? No, they are not allowed. Uh, the since these are multi-year funded awards, the downside is that no cost extensions are not allowed. All the money must be spent by the end of the project period, which is usually June 30th of the fifth fiscal year of the award. Uh, and if you don't spend all the money, the money goes back to the US Treasury. This is a matter of US statute. The NIH has no discretion in this policy. Okay, great. All right, um, let's move on to review because I think there are more questions about the review process. All right, 
Gene, you're up. Yes. All right. So who are the people that review my application and are they subject matter experts? They are subject matter experts. We, we do uh, identify uh, experts in the field. Uh, as you can imagine, with these this many applications, we um, they're, they're likely not to be spot on experts, which uh, in, in most cases you'd want. You'd want someone uh, uh, to be able to be uh, um, to understand the field and understand what the innovation would, would be associated with your project. So um, when you're describing your project, make sure um, you, you make it clear again, as Robbie mentioned, uh, uh, you don't need to mention, uh, uh jargon, uh, uh, understand that, that you'll be giving, uh, it'll be reviewed by someone that, that may be a generalist in this more specific field. Okay. Um, and are the names of the reviewers, um, made publicly available? Yes, they will. Um, Typically 30 days before the meeting, um, the roster is released uh, and, and uh, people can see the roster. And we will, we also post it on our website um, for those of you interested. Um, may I request to exclude a specific reviewer with whom I have a conflict of interest? Absolutely, uh, you can request uh, a conflict of interest or, or uh, just simply a request doesn't automatically mean that there is a true conflict. So we would need to know um, uh, the the nature of the conflict of interest. Uh, we certainly want uh, the merit of the application to drive the scores and not some inappropriate bias uh, uh, that 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 may uh, drive the score. So so yes, uh, um, you can feel free to contact the SRO me. Uh, and, uh, and let me know what your potential conflict may be. All right, and um, what are the reviewers um, tasked with focusing on the most for these? As we mentioned, the, the, the three um, categories there, it, it's, uh, the, uh, it's associated with the innovation um, and uh, the three that, that we mentioned earlier in, in, in the slide set. But uh, yes, uh, it, it's, it's uh, um, it's consistent with the high risk, high rewards. It's the innovation of the project and, and its ability to, to move the field, um, uh, as well as uh, as the innovativeness of, of you, the PI, and what you what you've shown through your uh, career so far. Um, and what do reviewers look for um, in investigator qualifications? Is it publications, prior funding? I think it's evidence that that you can actually uh, um, uh, complete the project. It's it, it's it's making a cohesive story. It's 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 telling why um, this research would be important. Why this research would advance the field, uh, and 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 how you're going to do it. What we say in review many times is, should it be done, and can it be done? So if you can get that across, that. That these are the goals of your project. They, they may be lofty goals, uh, and they may be risky goals. But, but, but why it's important to achieve these goals, and what's it going to do for science, um, irregardless of the approach. Uh, that, that's that's the one part that you want to be able to get across the innovativeness or or, or the the importance of this project, and then it's convincing the the can it be done, uh, and 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 and. Uh, it's it's not through your track record because we understand that that early stage investigators may not have an extensive track record, but it is um, um, evidence uh, supported by your training. And if you do provide a preliminary data, which you don't need, but uh, but uh, showing that 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 there are aspects that that uh, would enhance the possibility that it can be done. Right, and is it okay to contact previous reviewers to review my grant application prior to submission? Getting assistance and getting opinions from others is, is always important. Uh, contacting current reviewers uh, is 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 not a good idea. It, it's uh, you 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 never want to be able to uh, to to. Um, Contact reviewers. Certainly, you're not going to know that there are reviewers on, on this panel until 30 days prior to the meeting. So, please, as part of, of integrity of peer review, uh, nobody should be contacting anyone on, on the review panel. Now, folks that have served in the past uh, that, that you may know that you want to, to take a look at, at the project, um, 
you can identify any expert that you think would be important to, to help you with the project. Um, obviously, uh, if that person is selected as a reviewer, subsequent to that, they need to, to disclose that they were a reviewer and that there is a conflict of interest that they have shared their own uh, opinion on the application. So, um, so this balance of, of, of receiving help on one side, but not trying to tilt the process is, is very important. That makes sense. Yes. All right. Um, and uh, is there um, an option to uh, to submit a rebuttal um, to provide clarifications after the review process? Following the process, uh, we advise them to talk to their program officers. Uh, 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 <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, certainly, in in. Uh, and peer review within CSR under the chartered study sections or other types of study sections, since resubmissions would come back to us, uh, we would not uh, provide our opinions on, on uh, how to improve your application when we know that your application may come back for resubmission with us. Now, in this process, obviously, there's not going to be resubmissions here, but but should you have problems with, with uh, uh, that you think that the way that it was reviewed, you can contact um, the program officers. Right, and it's stated in the FOA that appeals are not allowed for applications submitted to this FOA because it's a, an RFA. Uh, we do provide the opportunity for scored applicants to provide a two-page response, which is voluntary, a uh, two-page response to the summary statement. But a, but formal appeals of the review are not allowed. Right, um, and are you allowed to um, send in updates such as accepted manuscripts, um, things that are relevant to the application after it's been submitted um, and before the review meeting? I believe in the FOA, um, it, it says that one cannot. Um, if, if there are issues, I think, associated with emergencies. Um, um, like a natural disaster. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, then there there may be exceptions there, but but as far as as updated data sets or or uh, even um, new publications. Right. And are um, yes, resubmitted applications given different consideration than first time applicants? We every application that comes in is considered new uh whether it's been here before or not uh even in in chartered study sections uh that, that we review at csr um applications can go through first stage and then and then a resubmission and then they, they're back to being new applications again uh in this particular process even if an application was seen here before potentially last year or the year before if it's being submitted this year it is submitted as a new application uh for new applications, again, uh, one should never uh, talk about how it's been improved since the last time it was reviewed. Uh, that, that would not be, uh, that would be non-compliant. So uh, um, yeah, so these are all new submissions and they're, and they're not resubmissions. Um, are the reviewers for the, the mail, in, mail reviewers and the editorial panels are, those two separate pools of individuals? They will be two separate pools. Uh, editorial board members will not be first stage reviewers uh, and, and, and obviously vice versa. Uh, um, we, we will uh, obviously recruit a lot of people to be male reviewers um, and um, they'll be two, two separate pools. All right. And, um... So who should I contact uh, to discuss the science of the application? So maybe, Jean, maybe you could just kind of go over the difference between Ravi's role as the scientific contact and your role as the scientific review officer. Right. So our review as scientific review officer is if you have any questions about submission, submission dates, uh, um, what may be compliant with uh, submission rules, uh, um, how when it's going to be reviewed, how it's going to be reviewed. Uh, if, if you feel that there may be a conflict of interest with anybody, those are administrative aspects of the review, you contact me. As far as the content uh, of, of your application, the science and how the science could be per, 
uh, presented. Since we're presiding over the review, we're not going to give um, recommendations on how you present the science. It, it, it just makes sense. That would be a conflict of interest from our side. So uh, anything uh, along those lines, uh, you, you, how you should uh, present the science, um, Robbie, is that, is that your field? Is that your yeah. Field? Yeah, so it's like separation of church and state. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, do we need to specify which um, NIH Institute our application should be assigned to for review? So, as we mentioned before, uh, one meeting, uh, it's, it's housed in, in, in our group uh, at CSR. So, um, the review will be done at the Center for Scientific Review. Well, I get a lot of questions from folks saying, "Well, oh, I'm, 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 uh, I need my application to be reviewed at at X Institute, NINDS, Neurological Institute, uh, NHLBI, uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood." Um, when we're at CSR, we are a standalone center. We review applications that end up uh, being considered for for awards at the different centers, but us ourselves, we are independent, uh, we're independent ent entity and independent center. Um, and so um, all the, so, so requesting that it, that it be reviewed by a certain institute is a moot point. <laughs> uh, the, the, the basis for its scientific review is done with us at CSR. Right. And um, do you notify applicants um, at each step of the review whether or not they have made it through? Answers no. Um, and, and and for a typical review, um, you will find out if you're so so as we go through the stage one and then through stage two and and uh, have uh, the stage two finalist applications discussed. Um, once the scores are released after the meeting um, is, is over, that's when you'll find out whether your application made it through stage two or whether uh, it, it didn't make it past stage one. Um, after the review, several days uh, after, the, after the meeting itself, uh, one will receive your scores if it was discussed or, or indication that it was not discussed 30 days, within 30 days after that is when you'll be receiving your summary statement. Uh, again, if your application was discussed, uh, you, will, you will see a summary of the discussion uh, of what was discussed during the meeting. That's written by the SRO. And, and you'll, you'll see the overall impact statements uh, of, um, uh, of the three editorial board reviewers. Um, if your application was not discussed, you obviously wouldn't see a summary of the discussion, but you would see um, the the critique uh, uh, the critiques of the three assigned male reviewers. Okay. Um, and can you comment more about the about track record versus expertise when evaluating applications? So, do investigators have to have last author publications for successful um, applications? I think that 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 when when the reviewers try to understand the the two questions again the should it be done and the can it be done the should it be done is obviously the 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 goals of the application uh, and and is this pushing the envelope and and, and that the, they're going to be evaluating for the conceptual aspects the conceptual innovation of of of, of your your application. When they get to can it be done, you want to be able to convince them that you can be done. They will be looking, they won't be saying, well, there's no track record here. And you wouldn't expect a big track record for early stage investigators. Um, but but you would want to see elements of success. You wouldn't want to see elements that give the reviewers confidence that there is a chance that this can be done. Uh, and, and and so, so no, it, it, it's, it's, they, we try to stay away. We try to, to, to educate the reviewers to stay away from having a, a, a certain rote understanding of, of the track record, uh, but really focus on can they actually get this job done? And is there evidence that 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 this this individual can can succeed in this project? 
All right, and are applications from underrepresented minorities and groups reviewed differently or through a different mechanism? Applications, uh, the, the, the reviewers are, 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 are trained uh, to, to look for the merit of the application. Um, and, uh, and, and they're, they're, they're looking to see the success based on the application. So no, they're, they're not gonna be reviewed uh, uh, any differently than anybody else. Okay, um, and then the, goodness, there are a lot of questions here. Um, uh, Ravi. Um, Becky. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's just so many. Um, uh, sorry, there's just, some of these are really specific. Um, what am I having for dinner? I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, some of these are so specific that I think they would be better answered offline through our mailbox. There's a lot of people saying that they um, aren't able to find um, who the PO for this, <laughs> this award is. So if you look at the funding opportunity announcement and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of it, it lists names of who the scientific review officer is going to be. That's that's Jean. And it also lists the scientific contact. And that's Ravi. So if you guys have questions about the scope of the award, you're, you want to um, talk about your, your scientific idea, um, you can reach out to, to Ravi. Um, it's best to do that through our email box, which I have been managing of late. Um, and I can give you a special way to get in touch with Ravi since he is handling hundreds and thousands of phone calls right now. Um, so you email our mailbox saying, I would like to set up a time to speak with Ravi. I will set you up. Um, that's the best way to do it. And Ravi is the appropriate person to contact. You don't need to reach out to other institutes or centers. Ravi is your man and he has all the answers, right? So he can, he can fix everything. Um, other, <laughs> I haven't talked, hyped it up too much. Um, other, other questions that are, have been submitted, a lot of them are very um, kind of basic about how do I apply? What are the steps? Um, and we are trying to help you out. We have created this application and award guidance um, website. Uh, it's listed in three places on our main page. So when you leave this webinar, you will automatically pop up onto the new Innovator Award website. When you get there, you can look on the left side main menu link. There'll be the application award um, guidance link. You can click on that. There's a slide that's rotating through our our slideshow that also has that link, or if you scroll down to um, on the web page, there's an announcement section. It's also listed on the announcements. You can click it there. Um, this guidance is not meant to be um, all telling. It's it's, uh, but it is trying to distill some of the basic information from the funding opportunity announcement, as well as information from the SF424 guide and NIH policy in one spot so that you have um, additional assistance in submitting these. We know that they're complicated, especially if you're new to it. So you use that. Um, please go there, but if you still have questions, email us and we will answer them as best we can. Um, so we are at 4.30. I know we didn't get to prob like, probably about 150 of your questions and I apologize for that. Once again, email, we will get to you. Our email is, um, Actually, we have a slide. You can contact us oh, um, at the new innovator at mail.nih.gov. Um, every the every line. <laughs> yes. This yes. is Ali. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Ellie has spoken wisely. Please read the funding opportunity announcement in fullness. Um, there's a lot of information in there, I know. Um, and then go to the application guide for additional assistance. Um, please try to figure out a lot of these things yourself because we do get swamped with questions, um, but you are welcome, more than welcome to reach out to us uh, for if you need additional help. Um, this is being recorded. Um, we have to get, we will get the recording. We will get it posted on our website. It'll be on the home page. It will be prominent. You'll be able to see it. You can download it, and we will also include a PDF of the slides there as well for you to download at your leisure. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and uh, we look forward to your applications. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.